In this episode of Clearing the Fog, I will shed some light on what I call every critic's goldmine. I understand that marrying a nine-year-old in 2018 just doesn't sound right, but before jumping on the bandwagon of insults and slurs, there's so much to consider. First, let's see how the marriage came about. When his first wife Khadija, 15 years, passed away, a companion by the name of Khawla bint Hakim said to the Prophet, Will you not marry again? He replied, To who? She said, To Aisha or Sauda. He said, Then go on my behalf. She later goes and mentions the Prophet's interest. Upon getting to Aisha's house, she learns that Aisha is already engaged to someone named Jubair ibn Mut'im. However, the marriage was later called off by the wish of Jubayr's parents out of fear of him embracing Islam. We see here the Prophet did not initiate the proposal, but instead someone else. We also have authentic hadith stating that he saw her in a vision, but doesn't bring it up. In other words, he doesn't say to Aisha's father, I saw in a vision that I'm to marry your daughter, so just trust me. So it was Khawla bint Hakim who was the one who suggested Aisha as a suitable candidate, knowing very well Aisha's age and the age difference between her and the Prophet upon whom be peace. So one might ask, what's the father's reaction? See, pseudo-academics insist that the Prophet was flat out wrong for marrying Aisha upon whom be peace. Had this been true, Abu Bakr, her father, would not remain best friends with him until his death and he would not succeed him to the throne of Khilafa. The same can be said about his daughter Aisha. See, someone might say, I'm sure she wanted to leave but couldn't. In fact, this option was given to his wives due to a lack of financial means. The Quran relates to us in chapter 33, verse 28, O Prophet, say to your wives, if you should desire the worldly life and its adornment, then come, I will provide for you and give you a gracious release. The verse can't be more clear. So the question is, how many of his wives left? None. What did his enemies have to say? They slandered him by calling him a liar, a soothsayer, a magician, and a poet, but none of them accused him of the silly antics we hear about today. One story that stands out is during the second year after the migration, Abu Sufyan, a staunch enemy of the Prophet before accepting Islam, is asked a series of questions by the Emperor Heraclius. This would be a golden opportunity for his enemies to silence him once and for all. However, Abu Sufyan makes no mention of the marriage that took place just the year before. So was Prophet Muhammad seeking a specific age group? Let's see. Khadija was 40 when he married her. Sauda was 66. Aisha was 9. Hafsa was 21. Zainab bin Khuzayma was 30. Um Salama was 27. Zainab bin Jash was 38. Juwaidiyah was 15. Um Habiba was 42. Safiya was 17. And at last, Maimuna was 27. These numbers do not suggest a specific age group, so to overlook all other ages and zero in on the nine is called cherry picking. So yes, Aisha was the youngest, but she was also the only one who was not previously married. Let's compare other marriages. Ruqayya, one of the Prophet's daughters, was married by age 10. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, Mary upon whom we peace, the mother of Jesus, was 12 when married to Joseph, who was 90. In the 13th century, Beatrice de Provence of France was 12 when married to Charles of Anjou. In the 16th century, Marjorie Baker of England was 12 when married to John Baker. In the 17th century, Elizabeth Stanhope of England was 9 when married to George Berkeley. And just in the 19th century, Elizabeth Hayes of the state of Kentucky was also 9 when married to Louis Napier. Today, the legal age of consent in all 50 states is at least 16, which is a stark difference when compared with the 1880s, when the age of consent was 10 in most states and only 7 in the state of Delaware. We find more clarity on this by Margaret Wade Labarge in her book, A Medieval Miscellany. She writes, It needs to be remembered that many medieval widows were not old. Important heiresses were often married between the ages of 5 and 10, and might find themselves widowed while still in their teens. Also, Susan M. Ross in her book, American Families Past and Present, writes, According to British common law, during the colonial period, the age of consent was seven. Today, we are astounded that girls of this age were assumed to know enough about sex or about sin to make such a decision competently. 
This explains why anti-Islam polemicists starting from John of Damascus in the 8th century onward are silent about this very subject, and it only begins to surface as an issue in the beginning of the 20th century. Here is how I can see this being an issue today. If there's textual proof stating that nine is linked to everlasting bliss, or if your Muslim neighbors down the block were marrying their daughters off at age nine, this is just not happening. Societal norms are always changing. Today, words such as shacking up or fallen woman are almost never heard of and never used. For example, fallen woman was used to describe a woman who lost her chastity before marriage. Shacking up or cohabitation refers to a couple living together but not yet married, which was once illegal. Now, what if I told you a woman was jailed for wearing trousers because it was deemed inappropriate? You'd immediately think of some crazy, radical, conservative country in the Middle East somewhere, right? In fact, it's a lot closer than that. It was in Puerto Rico in 1919 where a woman by the name of Luisa Capatello was sentenced to jail for wearing trousers in public. Also, in Los Angeles in only 1938, a woman by the name of Helen Hullick was sentenced to five days in jail for coming back to court in trousers after being told not to by the same judge. Again, because it was inappropriate. Things were much more different in colonial America when fornication was not socially accepted. If found guilty, you were punished by either paying a fine or you were struck with a whip in public. Fast forward to today and you're laughed at and ridiculed in high school if you have yet to engage in any sexual activity. By extension, having kids outside of marriage is normal today, but in our past, certain women saw infanticide as a rescue means to avoid being stigmatized. So the question is, why Aisha and what sets her apart? Number one, an early age coupled with an Edetic memory allowed her to retain the Hadith tradition, and it's for this reason that the bulk of women's laws come to us via Aisha. Number two, she was of the Mukhtirin. And this is a title for any companion who narrates more than 1,000 narrations. She is the only woman on this list, along with six other men. Number three, of all the women companions, she has the most narrations total in 2,210, compared to Um Salama at number two with 378. Number four, she was the daughter of his best friend. Number five, she was a scholar with her own convictions, so much so that it's said that the fourth of Islam is taken from Aisha. So, quick recap. Number one, the idea of marriage was initiated by someone else and not by the Prophet. Number two, Aisha was already engaged to Jubayr ibn Mut'am before her marriage. Number three, his enemies spread all kinds of hate against him but said nothing about this marriage. Number four, both Abu Bakr and Aisha remain loyal to the Prophet till their demise. Number five, upon hearing the proposal, Abu Bakr doesn't mention Aisha's age or the age difference as a possible hindrance. Number six, Ruqayya was also married by age 10. Number seven, in our past, it was not uncommon for girls to marry at a young age, irrespective of their geographical location. I'll end by this. Yes, this does not align with our perception of a normal marriage. However, to pass judgment on an event that transpired more than 6,000 miles away and more than 1,400 years ago with our present standards is intellectually dishonest. في إسلامي وإيماني أضاء الكون وزمن بإسلامي وإيماني أضاء الكون وزمن